Hello, welcome to the Humanitarian Voices, a monthly podcast from Human Angle. I'm Ahmad Selkida, your host. Humanitarian Voices is a podcast from Human Angle in collaboration with humanitarian organizations. Here, we discuss and spotlight the different forms of humanitarian crisis across Africa and what it means for the livelihoods and quality of life of the persons affected. We partner with and speak to humanitarian organizations for deeper understanding. However, for this episode, we will spotlight our reporting on missing persons and enforce disappearances, as well as the agony that displaced persons face. The psychological toll this tragedy has taken on our reporters underscores the region's overwhelming mental health crisis. Human Angle has primarily covered the situation of missing persons in Lake Chad. Although the tragedy of missing persons and enforced disappearances affects not only the relatives of those who have gone missing, but also their communities and society as a whole. Through our missing persons dashboard, Human Angle has documented thousands of cases of missing persons in Borno, Northeast Nigeria, with support of the Open Society Initiative of West Africa, OSIWA. We also beamed our searchlight on the Nifa women. A group of women advocating for the release of their husbands who had been arbitrarily detained by the Nigerian military on suspicion of being members of the terrorist group Boko Haram. The women insisted that they and their husbands were escaping the Boko Haram crisis when they were rounded up and transferred to IDP camps while their husbands were detained by the military. The majority of these men ended up spending more than seven years in detention without any form of trial. We worked directly with these women to report their misery on a daily basis. And the result was the release of over a thousand of these men. Unfortunately, thousands of these men remain unaccounted for to date. As we commemorate the International Day Against Enforced Disappearances, Human Angle joins a global plea to end the widespread impunity that has separated thousands of missing persons from their loved ones in Nigeria and across the Sahel. Listening as our reporters discuss their reporting experiences over the years. My experience over the years is really um, these kinds of experience that you meet people who are victims of the conflict which has been there for over a decade. You will see every day displaced communities are going through phases of problems and difficulties. Sometimes you see these displaced people are lacking access to humanitarian assistance and mostly you have to visit these displaced communities, whether in makeshift camps which are scattered all around the capital city of Borno State, Mejugri, or you have to visit them to the places that were, were located to be their displacement camp. This is just something that every day, as a journalist reporting this conflict, have to pass through. Today, here, in the region, you see people who have lost connection with their livelihoods, who have lost connection with their family, who have lost connection with their original communities. They have found themselves in a new place where you are only supported by humanitarian assistance and support from your relatives, which normally doesn't even come every day. And what normally we see here is displaced people in thousands gathered in one place and some rooming around in the cities. 
and looking for what to feed themselves and sometimes even what to wear. Following the conflict trends, just last year, the Borno state government has shut down a lot of displacement camp which are scattered around in the capital city, Medjugorje. And one of the resettled communities is Kirawa, a border town between Cameroon and Nigeria. This town is part of Goza local government of Borno state. Um, just last week, I traveled to Kirawa to assess some of the challenges and problems the community is facing over the past one year since they were resettled. And most important, they mentioned that they don't have functional education system. And also they complained that the clinic that is in their community is not really functioning well. It lacks so many things like manpower. It lacks the drugs to give patients and also the management complained to me that they don't have a very a good supply of electricity. And also aside from all these basic needs, they complained that they have a very, very weak security system because they are experiencing cases where the terrorists from the surroundings are intruding into the community to either steal clothing, food, and sometimes even abduct young girls and go to the bush with them. This is very worrying because most of them feel that without basic amenities, this resettlement program is really, really pushing them into more difficult living conditions. And the communities told me that most of the time they have to cross to Cameroon to access basic amenities. I've reported the violent conflict between the Sudanese armed forces and paramilitary rapid support forces since it erupted in mid-April, killing hundreds of people. Women and children are among the most affected victims, and they bear the brunt of the consequences. Since the beginning of the war, almost 2 million children have been displaced, with an estimated 700 children being relocated every hour. A lot of people have fled to neighboring countries, such as Chad, South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Egypt. Sexual violence have occurred against women and girls. In the first two weeks of July, around 200 women and 190 girls reported incidences of sexual and gender-based violence to a United Nations Population Fund facility. There are examples of water scarcity, malnutrition, sanitation, health care, and diseases such as malaria in displaced persons camps. As Human Angle, I've written a variety of reports about gender and SGBV issues, ranging from examples of financial abuse, intimate partner violence and rape, to the challenges of displaced women in Nigeria. But the most striking for me has to be a feature about the specific problems of people with disabilities who face abuse from their partners. Several months after the report, we have not seen any changes or concerted efforts by stakeholders to address issues raised in the report. Now, this pains me greatly as a journalist because the purpose of telling these stories is to effect change, but you find that the problems you consistently write about persist. Since I do not have superpowers to make these things happen, all I can do is continue my obligations as a reporter. Welcome to Vestiges of Violence. My experience as the host of Vestiges of Violence has been nothing short of tragic. The podcast has brought light on the various types of abuse and discrimination faced by victims of conflict, notably women and girls, some of whom are my age. The podcast is one of Human Angle's flagship programs that will continue to spotlight gender-related issues, particularly those affecting women and children in crisis zones. First, we want to be able to continue this vital work by being mentally well. And with your help, we do not want to stop until our objective of promoting core human values are met. The mental health consequences of conflict are not only felt by the victims, but it is felt also by individuals and groups who respond with news coverage and AIDS. 
The nature of the work of frontline responders, like journalists, humanitarian aid workers, and so on, exposes them to traumatic events, violence, and human suffering. And this invariably predisposes them to psychological distresses such as PTSD, anxiety, depression, chronic stress, and vicarious trauma. The near zero investment in mental health by the government and corporate bodies further compounds the woes of these heroes because it limits their access to quality and affordable mental health care. Investing in the mental health care of frontline responders and the general populace cannot be overemphasized. We therefore urge media organizations, donor agencies, and governments to prioritize investments in mental health care.